And welcome to the Bible study of the Abundant Love Church. I am Pastor Gary Bush. Delighted that you've taken this opportunity to tune in this evening uh, for our Bible study. We have Bible study, uh, Disciples Academy, the eighth chapter of the book of St. Matthew. Jesus tells us to go into all the world, uh, preach the gospel to every creature. Those that believe and are baptized uh, shall be saved. And it told us to teach them to observe everything that the Lord commanded us. He told us to make disciples. And so uh, we are advocating for disciples, not just church members. It's great to be a member of church, and that's a proper thing. But you want to be a follower. You want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so this evening, uh, we're welcoming you into our Bible study. If you're a new listener, uh, happy to have you this evening. Uh, we believe the Bible. We believe line upon line, precept upon precept. We believe book, chapter, and verse. And we don't think uh, God said anything that he didn't mean. He meant what he said, and he said what he meant. So tonight, uh, we're going to uh, sing a song. We're going to do a little housekeeping. Then we're going to sing another song, and then we'll go into our lesson tonight. Uh, our first song tonight is God is Great and Greatly to be Praised. Goes like this. The greatness of the Lord is inconceivable. The love that he shows is unconditional. The power of the Lord is unbeatable. Great is the God we serve. The greatness of the Lord is inconceivable. The love that he shows is unconditional. The power of the Lord is unbeatable. Great is the God we serve. God is great. And greatly to be praised. goodness and your grace this day. We thank you for the hand of our lives. We thank you because you are a great God and you are greatly to be praised. And so Father, we pray now that you would have your way in our lesson tonight. We pray that Rhema would come, the word of God. Let it hit its point. Let it accomplish what you have sent it to do. Save, heal, deliver, edify, encourage by the power of your word. Bless every listener tonight, those that are present in this place and those that are listening of uh, various places by way of this stream. We pray your blessings and your anointing upon them. And then, Father, let us do two things for sure tonight. Let us glorify your name and let us receive the blessing that comes from your word. Bless this one that will teach in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. And amen. All right, little housekeeping here. We do this uh, every particular time we come together. I want to encourage you to support your place of worship. Amen. You are part of a congregation. You are part of a body. And the body is incomplete without you. And so if your pastor, your teacher is streaming, uh, your prayers are very valuable to him. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So uh, pray for your pastor. Pray for your leaders. Uh, pray that God's will would be done and that he would be glorified through this pandemic. Uh, calling, texting, give him a word of encouragement to let him know that you appreciate the job that he's doing in this, if I 
can say it like this, out of season experience with the word of God. Number two, you want to financially support your house of worship. You want to be faithful uh, with your tithe and with your offering, your contributions, because the expense of the church goes on. And when you get back, you would like for the lights to be on. You would like for the air conditioning to be operational. So uh, uh, pay your tithes. Uh, uh, give your offering. Be supportive financially of your house of worship. Uh, Abundant Love members, of course, there are two or three ways that you can give. You can give by the app Givelify. You can find Abundant Love Church and Ministries there on the app. You can mail your contribution, not to the building, but you can mail it to P.O. Box 6577, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And that zip code is 46. 896. If you're in the vicinity of the building, uh, there is a drop slot on the church building. You can actually leave your contribution in the mail slot. And then, of course, if none of those um, methods will work for you, you can use discipline. You can set it aside. You know, Paul told the churches at Corinth, he said that there be no gatherings when I come. He said, set it aside so that when uh, we get there, it's already prepared. So if you don't have any of those avenues, set it aside, put it in a safe place. And when the Lord releases us and blesses us to come back into the congregation, you want to make sure uh, that your contribution is there. Uh, last but not least, you want to support the elderly of your congregation. Many of them do not have uh, technology. They don't have access to technology. And we don't want them to be forgotten while we're not able to congregate in the sanctuary. Um, even though we're in the third stage of the uh, back to uh, back to the, the, the plan for Indiana, back on track plan for Indiana, um, with spacing, you can have up to 100 people, but um, we're trying to be... Uh, keep a listening ear to the Lord and we want to do not necessarily what the state is saying for us but we want to do what's safe for our members and so as of such we haven't started meeting again uh, even though these streams we have spacing for these streams and some people come and sit in for our streams in fact uh, Minister Robert Murphy just kind of snuck in on us tonight he's in for the stream but as a congregation we're not meeting totally because we're looking to the Lord and we're looking for information that will let us know when it's safe to do so again. So having said all those things, uh, be supportive of your ministry, uh, be supportive of the work, and most of all, be supportive of the name of Christ. This is the time to shine. Just because you don't get a chance to go to the sanctuary is not a time to step back on your Christian witness and your light shining good works and deeds in the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. We're going to sing another song here. How about, how about follower of Christ? Is that okay? Yes. No. Play the other one again. Okay. Oh, it is Jesus. Let's do that. Okay. All right.
more time. Oh, it is Jesus. Yes, it is Jesus. It's Jesus in my soul. For Such a true song is Jesus in my soul. And like the woman with the issue of blood, I touch the hem of his garment and his blood made me whole. Amen. God bless you. Uh, we are speaking from a theme, the June theme uh, for our church and our preaching and teaching this particular month is represent Christ. And we derive that theme from four verses. Uh, from 2 Corinthians and the 5th chapter, we use verses 17 through 19, and I will read them from the King James Version. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, look, all things are become new. And all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse number 19 says, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Last verse number 20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. May the Lord bless his word. The word of the Lord is blessed, and the Lord blesses the hearers doers of his word represent Christ and this passage of scripture talks about being made a new creature in Christ Jesus verse number 17 is one of the most popular verses that you will find in the known Bible uh, and it testifies to the fact that any man that's in Christ he's not a remodeled or renovated creature he becomes a new creature uh, the most poignant uh, example of that is a caterpillar that crawls into a cocoon and when he comes out of the cocoon his appearance his manner his behavior is unlike anything he ever did before he went into the cocoon it's a metamorphosis it's a total transformation he is totally a new creature and that's what happens to us in Christ the old man that we were in the world the things that we did the things that we said the places that we went, the things that we thought. When Christ comes into a life with his power, there's a total transformation of that man. And after that transformation takes place, you have a new purpose. And the remainder of these verses talk about the purpose of Christ and our purpose. I am a firm believer that if you're going to imitate somebody, you have to have a good look and a good understanding of who they are. If you're going to imitate or emulate or mimic someone, you have to take time in studying them, their mannerism, the way they do things, the way they accomplish things, the way they go at things or, or uh, the motivation for the things that they do. You have to study that. You have to study it with great detail so that when you get ready to reproduce it, you want to reproduce it as close to the original as you can. And so uh, we see here in our lesson today, in this lesson text, that God had a plan. God involved Jesus in the plan. 
And Jesus has involved us in the plan. And so what we see, we see that Jesus is the express image of God. In fact, Hebrews, uh, the first chapter tells us that Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. He is the express image of his person. That is, Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God in the flesh. And when Thomas asked him, uh, just show us the Father and it will suffice us. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father because I am the representation of God the Father. And Jesus did his priestly work, his atoning work, his sacrificial work, and then he left us as representatives of himself in the earth realm while he's next to the Father in heaven. So it behooves us to put a... a, a a presentation, or if I can say, a representation of Jesus Christ that's as close to what he has declared in his word. Uh, our introduction says this. It says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It was God's desire, purpose, and plan to bring the brotherhood of man back into a peaceful and harmonious relationship with him. His plan was executed through the demonstrated life and sacrificial death of his son, Jesus Christ. The remainder of his work has been left up to us as believers and members of his church and body. We stand then as representatives and ambassadors of God by and through Jesus Christ. And so in the short version of this, if we are going to represent Christ, we have to know what Christ represented. Christ represented God. Christ, everything that Christ did, everything that Christ said, everything that he attempted and achieved, he said, I only work and do those things that please my father. He said, my father works and I work hitherto. I only work when God is working because I don't want any glory for myself. I don't want any recognition for myself. My sole purpose is to come in the volume of the book and do as God has said and is written of me. And so what we see from Jesus Christ we see a, a desire to do only those things that pleased his father and only those things that his father commanded. That is, Jesus was the representative of God in the earth realm. And Jesus came to represent to us who God is, what God stands for, and what God wants to accomplish. As we receive Jesus Christ, we then take on the work of Christ. And as we take on the work of Christ, we are to do the things that Jesus did. In fact, Jesus said, the works that I do, you're going to do and not just those works. You're going to do greater works because I'm going to my father. So we, as believers in Christ, we have come into the family business. That is, God wants to do it. Jesus is the person he did it through, and we as heirs and joint heirs, workers together with him, come into the work of God. And so uh, the word represent by definition means to be entitled or appointed to act or speak for someone in, a, in an official capacity. When you are a representative, uh, you're standing in someone else's stead you can speak for them, you can act for them, and you're not doing it rogue. You have their permission, you have their entitlement, and they allow you and permit you to represent them. That is what a lawyer does. When you have a lawyer in the courtroom, he speaks for you, and you have uh, basically entitled him to speak for you. In certain legal matters, when people are... Uh, uh, not able to conduct business for themselves. They have something called power of attorney. And when you get power of attorney, it entitles you officially to represent them 
and to uh, make decisions for them in their best interest. And so God is a spirit. And because God is a spirit, uh, he doesn't operate in the earth realm. He, he uses vessels. He uses individuals to operate in the earth realm to be a kinsman. Jesus had to come in the flesh. And by coming in the flesh, he is an official spokesman of God. And then he becomes an official redeemer or kinsman to us. That is, Jesus in the flesh being made like unto us showed us how to please God in the flesh and to achieve the righteousness that God wants us to have. Paul said it like this in Romans. He says what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son, he sent Jesus in the flesh uh, and for sin that the righteousness of the law that he gave might be fulfilled in us. That is, he sent Jesus to demonstrate to us how we please God in this body. And so uh, we are representatives not just of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is a representative of God. So we, while representing Christ, we represent God in this realm, in the earth realm. The Bible says that we are living epistles. That is, we are living Bible books that men read every day. When people are not saved, when they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, there are experiences that come to them to reveal to them that God is real and then sometimes what they see is somebody who loves Christ believes in Christ they watch the mold of their conversation the mold of their lifestyle and then they know that God lives we are witnesses of the Lord we are witnesses of the Lord in the earth realm and so just like Jesus represented God we are to represent God through the example that Jesus Christ set for us. And so God has entitled us when he saved us, when he gave us his spirit, when he put the earnest of his word down in us, it entitles us in certain respects to represent God. The Bible says that the light shined in darkness and light is an illuminator. So when you have the light of Christ, uh, everybody talk about, you know, staying woke. You're really not woke until you got the word. When you get the word, then you woke. And then you have light in your life. And when you have light, you can shed light and give light and share light with people who are in darkness. And so we are representatives of God. Verse number uh, 20 says that we are ambassadors of Christ. And so we are people that stand in God's stead and we represent God. We uh stand for the purposes of God and the plans of God that they go forth and come to fruition. So um, if we're going to do what Jesus uh, has commanded us to do, if we're going to accept this ministry of reconciliation, then we have to know what reconciliation is. We have to know if Jesus came to reconcile us and then he's given us the ministry of reconciliation, then we absolutely have to understand what reconciliation is all about, how to accomplish it so that we can represent God and represent Christ. Um, and so tonight, this evening rather, I want to talk to you uh, about two aspects of Jesus' work. Because if we're going to work like Jesus' work, then we have to understand uh, these aspects so that we can do it like Jesus did. And so Jesus was very, very concerned about God's purpose and he was concerned about God's plan. Jesus didn't come to do his own thing. God had a plan. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 that before the foundation of the world, he ordained that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. So this plan was drawn before the world even existed. And so when Jesus comes, he's not on his own plan. He's not on his own agenda. God has laid out an agenda in his word for Jesus, and Jesus is making sure that he accomplishes everything that the word said about him. In fact, 
when he prayed to his father in St. John 17, he said, all that you gave me, he said, I've kept them except the son of perdition that the scriptures may be, refeed, uh, may be fulfilled. And so Jesus did everything to fulfill what God said about him in the word of God. So he's very concerned with God's purpose and he's very concerned with God's plan. And so if we're going to represent Christ, we have to know what God's purpose is. We have to know what God's plan is. And so there are a few verses that reveal the purpose of God. And the purpose of God is the reason for doing it. It's why you do what you do. Um, and one of the most popular scriptures, uh, if not the most popular scripture in the Bible is St. John 3.16. Most of us can quote it. You know, without even opening our Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That tells you what God did. God loved, God gave, and God gave so that we could have everlasting life. But it's the next verse. It's St. John 3, 17 that will tell you why God did it. Verse number 17 says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 17 tells us God's purpose. Yes, he sent him because he loved us, but verse 17 tells us why he sent him. He sent him to save us. The purpose of God. God's intention was to save us. You know what happened? Adam sold us out when he disobeyed. And God could have done like we do when we're tired of something. When we're tired of something and it's run its course, we throw it away. You know, everybody's still talking about recycling, but a lot of things we're not recycling because not that it hasn't, you know, uh, not that it's lost all of its usefulness, but we're just done with it. We, you know, we... <laughs> You know, we want something else. Every time you trade a car in, doesn't mean the car has lost its usefulness. It just means you're tired of it. You want something else. God, if he wanted to, God could have went back to the ground, back to the dirt, back to the earth. He could have made another man. He could have gotten rid of Adam. He could have said, you know what? I'm not going to, you know, Adam ain't gonna, not going to obey me. So I'm going to make me a new man. And a new man would have done God bidding. But you know what? God loved the man that he made. He loved his creation. And instead of just getting rid of us, God puts a plan together to bring the alienated man back to God. Yes, man was alienated from God. When Adam sinned, instead of walking with God in the cool of the evening, he was hiding from God. And God said, our fellowship is broken, but it's my desire to have fellowship again with the man. So he devised the plan and the purpose was to bring man back into a harmonious relationship with him. In fact, the word reconcile means to bring back together after some adversarial circumstances. It means that there's been some tension, there's been some break in fellowship, some break in communication, and reconcile, reconcile means to bring those two parties back again and let them be compatible and operate again. God and, and Adam walked together, and when Adam sinned, they had to part because God cannot tolerate sin. So God had to deal with the sin issue to bring man back into fellowship with him. And so uh, that was God's purpose. It was the purpose of God to bring us back together. It was God. Listen, God was the initiator. We weren't looking for God. God came looking for us. And looking for us, he put something together, put a plan together so that the man that once walked with him can walk with him again. Um, he wants everybody to be saved. And this is something, even though everybody won't be saved, it's not because God hasn't made provision for everybody to be saved. And what is so uh, phenomenal about this is that people say, God won't send you to hell. God won't burn. Well, God is not sending anybody to hell. 
God has given you a choice. And if you end up there, it's not going to be because God sent you. It's going to be because of the decision that you make. Because literally, truly, God wants everybody to be saved. It didn't say God so loved the world, God so loved the church, rather, that he's sitting to save the church. It said God loved the world. God loved everybody in the world. And it's the desire of God that everybody is saved. Here it is in 2 Peter 3 and 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But God is long-suffering to us, word. Here it is. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's the desire of God that everybody repents, everybody receives Jesus, and everybody lives eternally with him in heaven. That's God's desire. But God made us free moral agents, and as a free moral agent, we have the power of choice. We can go if we choose to, and if we choose not to, we don't have to go. But the consequences are not good for you if you don't choose to go with God. But God wants everyone to be saved. His purpose was to save the world. And so when he sent Jesus, he didn't send Jesus just for the Jews. He didn't send Jesus just uh, for the church. He didn't send Jesus uh, just for any one faction or any one section of people. He sent Jesus for the whole world. And so Jesus came to do God's will, to fulfill God's purpose. God's purpose was that the world should be saved. And Jesus came to save the world. And the blood of Jesus is the avenue for each and every person to be saved. And so that is the purpose of God. That was the purpose of Christ. God wanted to save people. Jesus came to save people. And if we're going to represent Christ, it has to be about people being saved. I might get in a little trouble here, but I got to tell it like it is. It's not up to us to police the behavior of people. It's up to us to introduce Christ. If they get the right thing inside of them, you'll see the right kind of action coming out of them. Our job is to proclaim and demonstrate Christ, and then they have a decision to make when they get a good glimpse, a good look at who the Lord is. And so the purpose of God is saving people. The purpose of Christ was saving people. That has to be our purpose. We have to be concerned about people being saved. I'm praying earnestly for the time again when people get glad, people get genuinely excited about people being saved. People get excited now over all the wrong stuff when it comes to church. They're excited that everybody showed up. They're excited that everybody gave an offering. They're excited that they got a large congregation. And I'm not against any of that because the Lord said that the house should be full. But... Who getting saved? Who's finding the Lord? Who's finding the truth? That should be the lifeblood of every church. Every church should be operating and functioning so that some soul comes to the Lord. And there should be great rejoicing, not just in the local church. There should be great rejoicing of the whole church when a soul comes to the Lord. That's what they do in heaven when they get someone saved, the Bible says that the angels rejoice in heaven over that soul that's given their life. And so we have to be about the same purpose that God is. God wanted to save people. God wanted to free people from their sins. God wanted to release people so that they could have eternal life with him. Jesus came and carried it out. He demonstrated it. And everything he did was to bring people into a right relationship with God. He spent so much time, oh Lord, he spent so much time trying to get church people straight about how to have a relationship with God. Yeah. It's not a church relationship. It's not a relationship, you know, with rituals and ceremonies and, and all that's part of it. But look, it's a relationship. It's a friendship. You need to know God's name. God needs to know your name. 
You need to have a conversation. You need to have a walk with him. And you know, you need to take his instruction, take his advice, take his leading, take his guide. Listen, just like you get to know a person, that's how you get to know God. You got to spend some time with him. You got to spend some time in his word. You got to spend some time in his presence. And the more time you spend with the Lord, the better you'll know him. And the better you'll know him, the easier it is to walk with him. I'm from a, a track background, and even though I wasn't a runner, I was just a jumper. I only high jump, long jump, and triple jump. But I had a good bird's eye view of distance runners. And what I found out about distance runners, distance running is so different than sprinting. Sprinting is, hey, you get up there. You give it all you got, and you get to the finish line as fast as you can. But when it comes to distance running, you got to set a pace. You got to have a pace setter. And with a pace setter, once you get your gait, you get your pace, it will allow you to endure for the whole race. I've seen too many races where people started out too fast, and they died and couldn't finish the race. I've seen too many races where they started out too slow, let too much distance get behind, you know, between them and the leader and couldn't catch up. And so it's a nice pace. It's a gate. It's knowing what's before you and it's knowing how to uh, legislate the resources you have so that you can run the whole race. And when it comes to doing God's will, it's about knowing the purpose. When it comes to this relationship with God, you got to get a gate. You got to get a good pace with God. You got to walk not to your pace, you got to walk to God's pace and you got to make the steps and the strides that God has ordained for you because the steps of a good man, they're ordered by the Lord. And when the Lord orders your steps, you will have a good walk with him. And I don't have a pet and I am um, hope I don't make the pet lovers upset today. I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't have a dog, I don't have a desire for a dog, but I had a dog in the past. And what I know about a trained dog, when a dog is trained to walk with you, he doesn't keep tension on the leash. He has learned that he's not to pull. I've seen some people walking their dog, and actually they're not walking the dog, the dog is walking them because they're pulling and they're, you know, uh, uh, basically on their own. But when a dog has been trained, He's been trained not to pull against his leader. He's been trained to, you know, to walk with his leader, walk with his owner so that both of them have an enjoyable walk. And that's the way it is with the Lord. We don't want to walk ahead of him because we don't want to run into anything that he's not there to help us with. We don't want to walk so far behind him. We don't want to be like Peter, following afar off, but we want to be in the presence, in the vicinity, to walk with the Lord so that he will be pleased with us. And he's pleased when we mind the things that he minds. He's pleased when our purposes are his purposes. It's got to be about saving souls. It's, it's got to be about people knowing who the Lord is, finding out who the Lord is, and then walking with the Lord. And so Jesus was all about God's purpose. And if we're going to represent the Lord, we have to be about the purpose. The most important thing in our life has to be the word of the Lord and not just knowing the word for ourselves. It is sharing and witnessing that word so that somebody can come into a saving faith relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we're going to represent Christ, we got to have the same purpose that he had. And then number two, Jesus was very, very concerned with God's plan. And, and I've been pastoring a little while now. Uh, I've got a couple of decades in pastoring, but I'm still learning. You don't take off and do anything without first consulting God. You don't want a good plan. You want a God plan. You want to acknowledge God and let God give you the plan because the plan that God gives you will be successful. Uh, life is filled with people who had a good plan, but they didn't have God's approval on the plan. And so you not just want you don't just want a plan that's good. You want a plan that God approves of because the plan that God approves of will be successful. And so God had a plan for how to reconcile the world. Now, th this, just, this just amazes me. 
because it shows the care and the concern of God. God is sovereign. And God really, I mean, God really doesn't have to do anything. God can just uh, speak something into existence. He can speak something out of existence. I mean, his power is so massive. It is so overwhelming. It, 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 he's, he's so providential that anything he wills comes to pass. But God took great pain in this plan because in this plan, he cannot violate his person. He cannot violate who he is in saving us. See, a holy God has to judge all sin. So he can't just look the other way and act like our sins don't exist. Because if he does that, then he's not the holy God of the scriptures. So he's got to stay the holy God. He's got to handle the sin. And he's got to handle it in such a way that we can appear before him sinless. That sounds like a real easy thing, but that's a tough thing God had to deal with. I mean, not tough for us. Nothing is too hard for God. But the holy God, see, God has these attributes, and all of these attributes have to agree for God to be God. If God doesn't be the God of the scriptures, then he's not God. The Bible has declared certain things about God, and these things have to remain true. In fact, he's of one mind. Who can change him? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Two immutable things, two unchangeable things about God. That is, God can't sin, God can't lie, and God can't change. He can't change. He's got to be consistent with his person. Now, this person that God is, as I close, there's a justice part of God. Justice means that God is fair everywhere, which means if something is taken, something has to be replaced to be fair. You know, we have a lot of uh, uh, protests in the street now because some things are taken and they're not replaced. There's some injustice. But the justice of God, you know, eye for an eye, two for a two, blood for blood, life for life. You take a life, you give a life. In other words, that's the fairness. Whatever a man sold, that's what he's going to reap. That's the justice of God. And then the justice of God has to agree with the mercy of God. The mercy says, you know what? You deserve to die, but I'm not going to. I'm going to make it so that you can live. And then justice is looking at mercy saying, now how are you going to let them live when they've done wrong and took a life? And so the God has to, has to navigate all of this so that mercy is satisfied and so that justice is satisfied. You know what his plan was? His plan was Jesus. Jesus comes and pays the price to satisfy mercy and then, Je or rather to satisfy justice and then Jesus' sacrificial work gives mercy to us. So mercy is satisfied because you get to live and justice is satisfied because the sin is paid for and we find that here uh, that in the plan of God, it was God's plan to reveal himself. That unknown, unseen, unrevealed God had to be revealed to men. And it is St. John 1 and 18 that says, no man has seen God at any time. The reason we haven't seen him, because he's an invisible God. No natural eye has seen him. But the only begotten son, the only begotten son has seen him. He's in the bosom of the father. He had declared him. What we know about God has been declared to us through Jesus Christ. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus reveals God to us. We know who God is because of the work and the life of Jesus Christ. So God's plan was to reveal himself in the flesh through Jesus Christ. After revealing himself in the flesh, then it was God's plan to take care of the sin problem. Sin has to be paid for. Somebody has to pay for transgression. Transgressions do, just don't disappear in the justice of God. When there's a debt, somebody has to pay the debt. Let me tell you something. And you think when people eliminate your debt, you think nobody's paying for it? Oh, no. Somebody's paying for it. When you get a write-off, you may not be the one paying, but somebody's paying for that write-off. Because if a retailer sells you something and you're unable to pay all of the costs, and even though you don't pay the remainder of the cost, the retailer loses and absorbs the cost. So when a transgression is made, you can transfer the debt to different people, but the debt has to be paid for in the justice of God. And so when Adam sinned, it had to be paid for. One problem, 
Adam didn't have the kind of blood to pay for the sin. Adam contaminated holy blood. Adam was a holy man. He was made holy. He was made in the likeness of God. But when he sinned, he lost a holy life. And when he lost the holy life, he didn't have the power to replace a holy life. So he created a debt that he was unable to pay for. Ah, I hear you. You went financial on me just then. You got to be careful. You can't just, you know, you can't just charge what you got on the charge card. You got to charge your ability to repay. Just because that card said you got $5,000, if you can't repay $5,000, you shouldn't be spending $5,000 because you'll create a debt that you cannot repay. And so Adam created a debt. He could not repay the debt. And what God did in Jesus Christ, revealing himself, then he sends Jesus, the holy man, to pay Adam's debt. Here it is in 1 John 2 and 2. It says, and he, that is Christ, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That word propitiation means that that will justly satisfy the demands of a holy God. A holy God has demands, and you can only give him what he requires to satisfy him. The blood of bulls, the blood of oxen, goats and heifers, they did not take away sin. They only covered sin. They pacified sin until the Lamb of God came, shed his life, and took the sin of the world away. And so Jesus came to pay the sin debt. He paid mine. He paid yours. He paid Adam's. He paid anybody who will receive him. Jesus assumes their debt makes them right before God. So when you go to stand before God, you can stand righteous before God because your sins have been paid for. Does that mean you didn't say it? No, you said it. Does that mean you didn't do it? No, you did it. It just means you didn't have to pay for it. You know, it's kind of like going out to dinner with a gentleman. If you really go out to dinner with a real gentleman, uh, ladies, you don't have to pay for the cost. You don't have to go Dutch. Uh, a real gentleman is going to take you out to eat and, and you know, he's going to absorb the price. And, uh, and you know, so ain't no need of eating like you ain't got no food. You just may as well go on and go at it since, you know, it's going to be paid for. So, uh, uh, but that's what Jesus did for us. Everything that we committed, everything that we did, Jesus paid it in full. The song said, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had, sin had left a crimson stain. But he washed it white as snow. And so he paid for the sins of the world. And then after paying for the sins, he told us to declare it. Let people know that it's available. That's what we are here for. We are here to let people know that their sins are paid for. There's an avenue to get to God. God is not angry with you. God is not trying to destroy you. In fact, God desires fellowship with you. Uh, one of the greatest pictures of God is in the uh, story of the prodigal son. And I don't have time to go through all the prodigal son, but he leaves home early. He takes the inheritance before he's supposed to get it. He goes into a far land so that nobody from his family can see him. And he lives it up with riotous living. I mean, he, he's, I mean he's just having a, a, a time that's way out of the discipline and the upbringing of his youth at his father's house. And that's the way it happens. When you go and you go too far out there, it's kind of tough to get back. He lost all his money. When he lost all his friends, uh, when he lost all the money, rather, he lost all his friends. When he lost his friends, he fell in uh, hard times. He began to be in want. Then he joined himself to a country that he shouldn't have been joined to. And now, uh, you know, that's the way life, that's what sin will do to you. Sin, sin will just take you down, it'll take you down, it'll take you down, down, down. And then finally, there he is. I, you know, I get a visual picture of him. Uh, from the father's house, a lavish house, a great home with servants and land and livestock and prestige and status from that high place with the father. Now he is on his knees feeding pigs and hungry enough that even the husk that he's getting ready to give to the pig is looking good to eat. 
But you know, he had a, a wake-up call. He came to himself. He said, I'm going home. And that's good because we always talk about the prodigal son. But let me show you about the dad. Let me tell you about the father. Every day, every day the boy is gone. Every day the boy is out of the, the father's house. The father goes to the road, looking down the road for his son. Goes back home. Next morning, the father goes to the road. Looking down the road for his son. That's the way God is looking for us. God is always looking for us to make moves towards him. To come from where we are towards him. He's on the road. Looking down the road. The Bible says that when the prodigal son uh, was on his way home. The father didn't wait till he got home. The, he said a great way off. He recognized him. And then not only recognized him. Pulled up his robe and ran to meet him. And so God is always warning you. In his place. And so we have to share this news that God is not mad at you. He's not trying to destroy you. God wants you to be back in fellowship with you, with him, and God wants you to be at home with him. Last but not least, it is 1 Corinthians 121. And after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, and it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. To save them that believe. And that's the reason we preach. We preach so that people know that there's a way back to God. We preach, we teach, we instruct, we witness so that people know you can have a harmonious relationship with God. You can have the kind of relationship with God that not only blesses you, but it blesses God to be in it. The thing I love about real good friendships, real good friendships are give and take. You get just as much out of a good friendship as you give in a good friendship. And so two is better than one. It's good when you have somebody to help you when you're down. It's good, uh, uh, it's good to have somebody help you when you can't do it by yourself. And God is saying, I don't want you to walk by yourself. He says, I want to walk with you. I want to be a companion to you. I want you to understand that you can trust me. You can depend on me. I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. In fact, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the world. And so if we are going to represent Christ, if we're going to represent Christ as Christ represented God, then we must adopt the same purpose that God had, and we must follow the plan that God has laid before us. We have to demonstrate God, not only in our walk and our lifestyle, but we have to open our mouth and we have to witness and tell of the truth of the gospel. And so I want to encourage you this coming week, be a good representative of Christ. Live a holy life. Walk in obedience. Watch your tongue. Watch the things you say. Be light in darkness. Be salt among those that don't know the Lord. And certainly somebody will see your chase life, your chase conversation, and want to know who the Lord is. Praise God. All right, let's pray and be done here tonight. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for the edification of your word. We thank you that understanding and comprehension comes from your word. And so, Father, I pray that every person that tuned in here tonight would know the purpose of God. Not that we should destroy, but that we should build up. Not that we should divide, but that we should bring together. Give us, Lord, a heart to bring people who don't know you into a harmonious and compatible relationship with you and then father give us courage to follow your plan we understand that some plant and some water and if we're just the planter help us to continue planting if we're just the person that waters help us to continue putting water where you've designated us to put it but father we understand that your word doesn't go out void and that the increase comes from you so help the body to do their part so that increase can come from the hand of the lord we ask it all in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. All right, God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.